Today's video is brought to you by Audible. Audible provides an easily accessible way to access audiobooks for its members, just one of the reasons why I recommend it, along with enabling you to make huge savings on the newest full-length Warhammer audiobooks. As an Audible member, you get one credit every month to use on any title across their entire premium selection, but clearly credits are best spent on the longer 9 hour plus premium audiobooks. Given the theme of the video, I decided to select a couple of audiobooks to suit. One is a brand new offering for 40k, simply titled Krieg, which should be pretty self-explanatory. The second an absolute classic, first and only book one in the Gaunt's Ghost series. Both of these offer lashings of lasgun action, and I'll share some thoughts on both at the end of the video today. You can start today using Audible with a free 30-day Audible trial. To get yourself full access to thousands of audiobooks, originals, and podcasts, all you need to do is visit audible.com slash Luton, and for those in the US, you can text Luton to 500-500. Arthur C. Clarke famously described as early as 1962 that any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. This concept is also one of the fundamental narrative underpinnings for the state of human technological decay under the stewardship of the Mechanicus and Imperium in 40k. It's also relevant in our discussion today of las guns and the continuing debate of recoil or no recoil, or beyond that, what even is a las gun? Now thinking about our questions today, while some of you may on the face of it say of course a laser weapon wouldn't have any recoil, what kind of stupid question is that? Which seems fair enough for obvious reasons. But as my recent question on the community tab highlighted, a surprising amount of others say well hold on now, let's consider all the evidence before we make a conclusion. Yet still others might say hang on even more of a minute, you're worried about what? Recoil? in your handheld space infantry laser gun that could be reasonably stacked alongside space marines and titans having the infinite ammo perk straight out of 80s action movies or you know all those practicalities of chainsaw swords. This is in fact sort of the question within a question because this debate about las gun recoil or not seems to stem from two quite specific camps of thought when it comes to people's perspectives on interpreting law. One side wants to strictly apply science with no room for fictional interpretation whatsoever, whereas the other simply says, you're trying to apply our current understanding to weaponry that exists thousands of years in the future, which is seemingly the most dirt cheap basic future AK-47 equivalent, but power packs that you can throw into a fire to charge, but yes, let's limit its operational parameters to 20th century understanding. And that's when the arguments begin. Well first, how about we consult our Astra Militarum field manual. The Munitorum describes LAS weapons as firing an explosive energy blast with similar effect to a bullet or small shell. Interesting, so not a laser. Well it goes on to say about power packs describing laser technology is reliable and easy to maintain and replicate. Okay, confusing then. So like a bullet, but a laser. If you want me to make things more confusing, you should see the selection of quotes that I steadily acquired, each one more contradicting than the last. In Scourge the Heretic, for example, it states, quote, just point and squeeze, don't snatch, and pray to the Emperor to guide your bolt. It's a las weapon, so there's no recoil to worry about. Well, there you go, case closed. Except, in one of the very new narratives, Krieg, it describes, quote, a virtual tidal wave of green flesh bore down on them, which their guns could hardly miss. She fired one-handed, though her las gun bucked with each recoil, spraying out bright beams haphazardly. Okay, so there is recoil with las guns. Well, hold on now, in the battle for McGrath Hive, it states, quote, The flare filled her vision and the bolt lit an eye-searing stripe across the pool's surface. It uplit the target's face for a moment, a shaggy mess of hair, a snarling face, 
that might once have been human, then the LAS bolt connected, and kinetic energy turned to searing heat. So progress, okay, LAS bolts have mass, hence kinetic energy, hence recoil, right? Well, it's also mentioned in the Gaunt's Ghost series, so we got that one solved, we're done. Wait, hold on, in the 13th Legion, it says, men started firing their LAS guns at the approaching vines, shearing through the tendrils with bolts of compressed light. Right, okay, so no mass then, no mass after all. You might start to get the point here. I could literally go on and on and on. Now, I'm always trying to find ways of mentally bridging reality with a fiction that I'm invested in. It's a fun thing to do, but it's certainly nothing I'd lose sleep over. Unless, of course, you're talking about the design of second edition assault cannons and how they make no sense at all, but that's a whole other thing. Now, I do enjoy engaging with fictional verse details as thought exercises, in the sense of how much reality can we apply here? The key element of that being how much? Because when it comes to LAS guns, trying to make some sense has severely tested me. I enjoy making reasonable assumptions, but in doing so, this also means that you could well end up framing something with what is essentially headcanon. But as I've said before, I'm okay with this if it makes reasonable and contextually applicable sense in the law. This is why when it comes to Warhammer, I stopped caring quite some time ago about the concept of spoilers, because I came to see the 40k verse more as a very large puzzle with new information coming from many different directions all the time. The order in which this arrives became very relevant to me, I just like to know. Anyway, middle, 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 the short version is that I try to keep clear my opinions versus sources as written, which hopefully most of you already know by now. So when it comes to LAS guns in 40k, you may need to mentally prepare yourself to take a collective deep breath, step back and consider it may not actually be as simple as laser equals light equals no mass equals no recoil. I know in other verses that may be true, but this is 40k. Besides, light equals no mass equals no recoil, it's hardly a groundbreaking conclusion at this point, nor complex to understand unless you skipped high school physics. So knowing this from the outset makes LAS guns no recoil the very, very most obvious conclusion one could possibly make. It's also been discussed already for decades. Yet it's one of those strange questions that won't go away. It really should have been put to bed, except it will not. The reason why is not at all surprising, and don't worry, I won't be making anything like as big of a detour as we did when we're talking about the warp, because at the end of the day, the problems here do not apply to just one thing. It merely underscores most visibly in somebody's mind that most weapons of M41, I'm sorry to say, operate with a high degree of spaceosity gun logic, meaning don't overthink it. Unfortunately, most of the time I say no, I do want to overthink it, hence why will take some time to explore this, because it piqued my interest this week. Unfortunately, it also ended up taking me a lot more time than I expected, as I had to trawl through a metric ton of text to try and find references and descriptions. I kept hoping that I was going to find a definitive conclusion. So first, and perhaps more importantly, some of you might simply be just asking, what's a lasgun? Lasguns are one of the Imperium's core pieces of weaponry for its military. Not for the Space Marines, but its ordinary human soldiers. When it comes to LAS guns, like so many things within the galaxy of M41, at face value things seem relatively clear and self-explanatory. In actuality, it's often not as clear as some of us might want to imagine. For example, while some sources will describe LAS guns as laser weapons, just as many others, including combat descriptions, describe LAS guns firing these explosive energy blasts with more similarity to perhaps that of the semi-automatic firing of a standard projectile weapon, but with a LAS gun, it's in some form of energy bullet or shell, whatever that means. In the novel 13th Legion, for example, the last chances use the phrasing of LAS gun bolts or LAS bolts quite heavily. In an isolated reference, the description is seen elsewhere in Fist of Demetrius, Gaunt's Ghost, Company of Shadows, just to mention a few, many of the newer novels as well. So while you find technical descriptions of LAS guns early on in law sources speaking to specifically lasers, these decrease over time somewhat. It becomes more vague the more you go along. There's generally a more considerable weight of references to LAS gun fire being described also as bolts of energy or 
bolts of compressed light. The key thing either way being this phrasing of bolts rather than a laser, as well as the actual dimensions of the beam. They're often describing them boring sizable chunks or holes into targets, whereas a laser beam is obviously quite something different to that, more specific, more to a point in the form of its energy. Still, observations are one thing, but when it comes to this talk of laser shells, I'm just going to hold my hands up. I've got nothing for you there. I tried to think around it, but it just gave me a small headache. So I'm putting laser shells, or in the case of the multi-laser, as seen on a chimera, descriptions of laser energy shells. I'm putting that into the pile of law things that I don't want to think about again, along with depleted deuterium. Lasguns as the rifle of choice for the vast bulk of Imperial soldiers, it needs to be easy to source and manufacture, while also being debatably expendable as those carrying it, although there are references where they are definitely not expendable. The weapons, I mean. I feel heretical also speaking so flippantly about the holy tools of the Imperium, but it's just the reality. When many deployed Imperial Guard may experience life expectancies measured in terms of hours, not days. Then again, some officers of the Imperial Guard have often said to the soldiers, hey, if it looks like you're gonna die, chuck your weapon out of the way, please. And you might think that that's just something I'm making up here for fun. No, that's actually in a, that's actually in a source. So from a monitorum and administratum perspective, you wouldn't necessarily want to be equipping your most expendable assets with high value, technically complex weaponry processed using rare materials. Lasguns are durable as well, which is a plus one in the camp of it not being a refined laser with some crystal lens focusing system. Lasguns can be thrown around, dropped, used as blunt force instruments and seemingly continue to operate just fine. In fact, basically everything about them screams, I'm not a traditional laser, as we understand. As I said, they're basically the far future version of an AK-47. This is often what I think the inspiration is behind lasguns. Of course, the practicalities of production are important, but when it comes to how weaponry is viewed within the Imperium, just as bolt guns will be sanctified and worshipped as prestigious tools of the Emperor for use by Astartes, Sororitas, even higher grades of Imperial Guard, the humble lasgun is equally venerated by service members of the Militarum. I'll make many references throughout this video, but again, one of the very confusing things about lasguns is how they're described physically. One specific reference that I find very jarring is the description of the weapons being stripped and oiled. This is often referenced about guardsmen knowing how to strip their weapon and oil it. Stripping it and oiling it. What moving parts are they having to oil in their concentrated light energy gun? It's highly confusing. Lasguns exist as a truly indispensable piece of kit for frontline members of the Imperial Guard, just as much as bolt guns would for Nastartes. It's simply necessary that lasguns are produced on a far greater scale. Human infantry for the Imperium should number upon hive worlds alone in the tens or even hundreds of millions when we're considering hive city garrisons, as hive cities themselves can contain tens of billions of citizens. You may remember my discussions about more realistic estimations of guard numbers on planets or across entire systems and sectors comparative to battles often described in the law with tens of thousands of deaths. These numbers are barely a fraction of anything that would really register for the Imperium. A lot of conflicts described in 40k should be talking about far higher numbers to be really of a believable scale. It's always confused me. Especially when you're talking about systems in entire sectors of the galaxy, the Imperial Guard's strength should certainly be expected to be in, say, billions. In some of the more recent lore offerings, I've actually seen slight leanings toward adjusted descriptions of numbers to make, well, to make more believable sense, frankly. Because having a planetary war and saying, oh no, we lost some thousands of guardsmen, then simultaneously talking about war on a planetary scale, conflicts across entire systems, it's kind of weird and it's actually very jarring and undermines anybody wanting to really immerse themselves in such things. But perhaps only about as jarring as lasguns having kinetic energy. Lasguns often get a bad press as well for being ineffective weapons more akin to torches or flashlights more likely to just bounce off the more horrifying enemies of humanity before they devour said guardsmen. Considering lasguns more objectively and without the very, very tired memory that exists, the lasguns reliability, effectiveness, functionality and simplicity demonstrated in actuality to be perhaps one of the most essential elements of hardware for perhaps even the very survival of the Imperium. Plus, if we were talking about the sheer logistics 
it might not be too much of a stretch to suggest that no las guns may well equal no Imperium, or at least a very diminished Imperium. Because the fact that a las gun need not necessarily be really resupplied continuously with consumable ammunition makes it unbelievably valuable for isolated combat. Unfortunately though, when we flip the coin of law over, the descriptions of las gun effectiveness vary wildly. From cutting clean through enemies with sizable chunks, to pinpoint shots, heat damage that will vaporize someone's brain but only deal surface level damage to tissue, not penetrating bone, bouncing off of armor or literally bisecting organic life forms. Descriptions of concentrated light laser energy to literal kinetic force that knocks people off their feet. Specific clear descriptions of las guns having no recoil to descriptions of someone using it and it definitely 100% having recoil. To put it simply, it's absolutely all over the place. You guys know I always try my best to find a clear answer about stuff one way or the other, but I'm telling you now, when it comes to las guns, there just isn't one. It's absolutely anything goes. It's just about the most inconsistent piece of tech and lore that I've researched in the 40k verse. There's no definitive answer, that's the bottom line. Still, if we're talking about comparable illustrative things, one of the best that I've found in terms of laser rifles, in my opinion, is the opening for Terminator 2. In fact, it's always struck me as a battlefield that looks quite 40k, as the ragged survivors of an apocalyptic destroyed world run through it firing their pulse laser rifles. In fact, the laser rifles of T2 even appear to have been pretty accurately depicted as you see them not vaporize enemies nor cut people apart, take their limbs off. Instead, we see one guy hit with several bursts the shock and power of them is enough to drop him instantly and you see them penetrate through, but with very pinpoint accuracy. It's definitely quite representative of how a laser rifle may well work. But before we get more into that later on, we were talking also about the role of las guns in the protection and survival of the Imperium. And while of course you have the factions like the Astartes, very powerful, the Inquisitional Zealots via the Imperial Navy, able to deliver the Emperor's Holy Exterminatus, all these things are very specific and more importantly considerably lesser in number than the sledgehammer of the Imperium, the blunt force trauma of the sheer weight of human bodies that is the Imperial Guard. Space Marines are elite, they're capable of handling the most impossible objectives, but in M41 it's rare to see them wield the sheer bulk of force able to readily defend all worlds. They may in fact be unable to even reach some worlds in time to intervene and turn the tide of events. Many times even when marines are present, superhuman as they may be, the reality facing them in the form of the sheer weight of enemy numbers proved to be an insurmountable obstacle. This is where the supreme power of the Imperium comes in, the Imperial Guard, the true currency of the Imperium and their vast galactic empire, not one paid in coin but in that of human flesh. The most valuable commodity in the galaxy for the Imperium is out of a constant unending swell of anonymous human souls, produced by hive cities and gathered through the Imperial Tithe. The Imperium has its godlike weaponry, it has its transhuman soldiers, it's true, but often enough what makes the ultimate difference between survival and annihilation for worlds and systems throughout the galaxy are those brave souls who fight under the banner of the Imperium and whose default infantry weapon is the humble lasgun. Now despite everything I've said, before we get to the question of does a las gun produce any recoil, we really need to be considering a question I've often wondered but rarely seen people even question. That being the troubling issue of, is a las gun even a laser weapon? To state the obvious at this point, the Imperium are more often than not incredibly backwards, but especially so when it comes to technology. Therefore, the idea that they may simply have mixed up terminology to describe something they fundamentally have no understanding of how it works is, for me, well within the parameters of the 40k verse. It's also a concept not entirely without some reasonably plausible merits. The Imperium of Man in the 41st millennium exists, if I were to use an analogy, as something of a comparable equivalent to that of humans who have survived a full 20th century total apocalypse where the survivors are left crawling around scratching at the ruined fragments of a formerly technologically and socially advanced complex society which is now far beyond their comprehension and within generations little more than retold stories 
eventually to become myth. These ignorant and damaged survivors' world overnight becomes one of fear, pain and superstition. They're left trying to comprehend generations worth of lost knowledge and advanced fabrication. Instead, their natural abilities leave them struggling to begin even tackling basic problems, leaving them suffocating under the weight of their own ignorance. They have fragmented pieces of information gathered, sure, even some functioning and intact pieces of equipment. But the words they read mean nothing now, the diagrams they observe are confusing and outside of their understanding, nor do they retain the knowledge, resources, or even the time required to begin to garner some understanding of what missing pieces are necessary to make something functional again. The idea of such a society's ability to say, reverse engineer advanced fabricated technology is comically misplaced. Because such a thing would require deduction, reasoning beyond their ability, but far more importantly it requires this fundamental understanding of techniques and processes based on specific technical knowledge, something they would acutely lack and worse, now some of their number who have diverged into superstitious beliefs even actively fight to prevent such knowledge becoming part of society's general understanding once again. So their problems are not only compounded by those who are superstitious and fearful of such knowledge and what it could mean, they seek to undermine all efforts of those who want to acquire this power of knowledge. And this is very like the Imperium, because when it comes to the Imperium, their understanding or approach to technology far in advance of their own, one of the major issues is not merely its application, but of course the knowledge needed for replication. The Imperium and the Mechanicus undoubtedly have technology and schematics that clearly they realise must be useful in some way. In some cases an STC is whole enough to enable the production of a product that is applicable to a service or requirement. If this is not the case though, then they may encounter issues whereby they can produce a thing, but they have no understanding of what it's for, what it's doing, powered by what or its capabilities. And this within the Imperium generally leads to fear. Fear of accidentally empowering something that they may not be able to control or lead them to their ignorant own destruction. Meaning some things they may not even attempt to fabricate for the fear of what it could lead to. Heads up, it's usually something something AI. Still, these are concepts of a much larger generalized scale. And just because the lasgun is a fairly standard issue piece of a kit that can be more readily produced and repaired, this doesn't equate to Imperial techs necessarily having very specific understandings of the science, meaning how a lasgun functions in terms of what it's doing and how it's firing. This is a considerably specific situation for the Imperium of 40k, because unlike other narratives which usually rely on a brain character who knows all the science or perhaps just scavenging things which already exist thereby not requiring the actual knowledge of a thing, within the Imperium there is this strange grey line between acquiring knowledge and understanding it. The Mechanicus want to know how to produce things, how to maintain them, how to repair them, but fundamentally acquiring the base science and therefore the ability to produce new things, that is to say to creatively invent, now that strays into the heretical. This is why in the past an STC pattern for something could exist and be used in production for say a millennia, but then perhaps through damage or a Xenos attack these patterns are lost entirely because they never bothered to research and retain the core knowledge of the thing being produced. They only know how to construct X thing as told to them by an STC pattern and once produced they focus more on the ability to keep things functional. Now I'm not suggesting this is universally true, we believe that the Mechanicus certainly attempt to create say hard copies, retain knowledge through their vast data stacks and in fact they have entire worlds dedicated to this purpose of just data securing as do administratum, vast labyrinthine subsurface mazes of stored knowledge that may mean servitors enter and are just never seen again when it comes to filing and storing data. It takes the job of data entry to a whole new level that's for sure. But even copying and replicating say an STC could be seen as entirely heretical by the Mechanicus because you have to remember that they are very religious in their views and copying something as holy as an STC could be seen by some as a, a degradation of the most pure state of knowledge. In case you noticed, subtlety and practicality are rarely applicable in the context of the factions of M41. 
This is why I often believe it's important to actually immerse yourself in the world of the Imperium and to effectively bring yourself down to eye level with the world we're so invested in. Now, entirely understandably, when you're talking about something like Lasgun lore, some might consider this mentality overthinking a straightforward question, and sometimes that's actually true. But I would say, when it comes to the Lasgun and Las weapons in general, this isn't really the case, mainly thanks to the wild inconsistencies in their descriptions. Thankfully, I know that considerably more of you joining me today are on the same page and moreover love these overthought mental exercises as much as I do. The state of decay that humanity has found itself in M41 has left humanity ruled over by the dystopian horror of the Imperium, trapped not only by its own brutality and ignorance, but also compounded by its heavy-handed quasi-religious systems which mandate societal-wide indoctrination and that aggressively prevent and actively advocate for the elimination, if not public execution and torture, of any who would seek even moderate levels of enlightenment, all applied with a large brush of extreme prejudice. I feel though at this point it's always worth noting that in a galaxy so vast there is room for planetary systems which are, if only by degrees, considerably more open-minded than others. The region known as Ultramar, for example, being one of them, where you might struggle to say that things were anything close to, say, a democracy, but certainly still more open to spoken debate than other far more brutal and oppressive realms where any kind of discussion like that it basically means execution. The point I'm trying to make is that across an entire galaxy, there are going to be shades of grey when it comes to how the Imperium is, and that also goes for how technology is used and retained. So when we're thinking about the loss of knowledge, subsequent limitations of just what that might mean, especially whether we're discussing about something being reverse engineered, this is something that I've discussed before at length. Because one, it's interesting, plus it annoys me how concepts like reverse engineering are just readily thrown around, it's a lazy rationale for unlocking the keys to all knowledge, essentially. Because reverse engineering tends to be used for mainly gaining understanding of things where we already have the base knowledge and science for it, so that we could recreate or understand past processes better. Not so often would it be that you go to something where you don't really have any understanding of even the core concepts and then try to learn about that thing. Because otherwise you're getting into this analogy of somebody handing an iPhone to an Iron Age person and saying, hey, reverse engineer that. They'd probably be at first terrified of it, maybe even start worshipping its magic powers or something. Which sounds familiar, doesn't it? Because it's near enough how the Imperium operates. This gulf of knowledge between the modern Imperium and the zenith of human understanding during the Golden Age should never be underestimated. One of my favourite case in points being whenever they tend to encounter AI. The best, of course, being where an AI absolutely humiliated Space Marines and Mechanicus aboard the Spirit of Eternity, where the AI is having near enough a mental breakdown as it cannot cope with just how backwards and intolerable the humans of M41 have become, before cutting through several ships' void shields like butter and raging off. So we know that the Imperium and the Mechanicus struggled to piece together technology, especially when it originates from humanity's zenith period of technological glory, known as the Golden Age, or in terms by the Imperium, the Dark Age of Technology. But does that include the humble Lasgun? The answer is almost certainly yes, because we know that Lasguns are produced seemingly outside of STC production alongside those that are strictly based on STC instruction. How that is possible remains unclear, but generally speaking this allows us to make a reasonable deduction that at least the origins of Lasguns were predating the Imperium. Las weapons generally appear to have been continually adapted and refined over time, of course within the reasonable constraints placed on all tech by the Mechanicus. Some have optical attachments, there are some with slower fire rates and more power, some are even multi-barrel. They can be pistols, rifles, carbines, heavy weaponry, and descriptions of their functionality, as we've said, a broad spectrum. Or to put it another way, if you are betting on the Imperium not being ignorant to the fundamental functionality of its own technology, let me tell you, that's not something I'd be rushing to put hard cash on. But if you're still set on the Lasgun doing what it says on the tin though, let's come back to that idea I had earlier. We might speculate that somewhere along the line, during say the small event of the complete and total collapse of galactic human civilization and its subsequently painful resurrection out of the Age of Strife, caused a misunderstood naming convention that stuck. 
the term in Low Gothic of Lasgun had evolved to become the norm, or even just the term of Laz and Laser. This doesn't seem at all uncommon during the destroyed period of human civilization, where people would just call things regional names and perhaps these kind of more simplistic or emotional terms might have come through. In my mind this feels reasonable enough, but to play devil's advocate, the problem with that is that then you come back to this sticking point of things being produced by STC. You would presume, wouldn't you, that perhaps on some STC hard copy it likely has the title of the thing you're wanting to make, e.g. lasgun underscore 0046 underscore copy 1. Also the Mechanicus. They're not golden age enlightened, sure, but at least being able to understand concepts that are taught at base levels of physics, that seems surely reasonable. This is often the end point though of reasonable law speculation, when you realise it comes down to essentially, we don't have enough information. And I know it annoys people when I try to do mental gymnastics to explain away what is essentially just a misuse of the word laser, but listen, this is what's fun for me okay, I like to keep things in fiction, so what you end up with is given the available parameters of what we know, what's your best plausible guess. But before that, an additional corner piece of a puzzle. Now, an additional factor to consider are the descriptions of those not within the Imperium itself, within, say, the Underhive of Necromunda. There are, of course, many gangs fighting turf wars and for control of valuable trading networks, as well as gun shipments, narcotics, and so on. One of these gangs is known as the Vansar, and undoubtedly we will get to speaking about them more broadly. But one major difference with the Vansar of Necromunda is that they astonishingly have considerably high levels of technology. In fact, the Vansar run counter to much of the Imperium when it comes to technology. In fact, they seek to unravel humanity's past and throw off the shackles of decay, stagnation, and ignorance. Believe it or not, it is said that the Van Saar gang of Necromunda have in their possession an STC, the standard template construct that the Mechanicus so passionately seek, and that through their connections with powerful figures in Necromunda have so far managed to keep this secret. Their activities are actually contained and confined to the vast depths of a labyrinthine hive city. Now to be clear, as I've noted before, there is confusion around the term STC. This is because an STC can refer to the hard copies of data sought by the Imperium and Mechanicus that are used to essentially print and fabricate the machines and hardware of the Imperium, but it can also refer to the construction and likely AI that was once long ago the core source of knowledge at humanity's zenith during the Dark Age of Technology. And it is this device, in some form, that the Van Saar are believed to hold in their possession. As crazy as that may seem, it also appears that some STC that we recently learned may be in the possession of the Leagues of Votan. If they do still exist, they may be barely functional and heavily damaged at this point in time. Long past are the days when an STC could be given a query of any level of complexity and immediately present a solution. Regardless though, the STC controlled by the Van Saar is likely one of the most advanced and intact STC possibly in the entire galaxy. The fact that it exists unbeknownst to the entire Imperium is comically apt because of the inefficiency and general dysfunction of humanity's rotting empire. This Van Saar STC though is capable still of not only storing and also producing construct templates, which in and of itself is wildly powerful. It also is able to manufacture new working prototypes of technology for then mass production. This is basically unheard of throughout the Imperium, spanning the entirety of the past 10,000 years. It certainly appears to have some sort of AI, because occasionally the STC has to be moved to avoid detection, or it used to have to be moved, and being dragged out into, say, the ashen wastes hidden into cave systems, this was seemingly made more difficult by whatever this STC is, would begin reaching out, searching for ways to integrate itself almost organically with power relays, communication networks, and so on. As it exists in M41, it has now been stationary within the Underhive for so long, it's believed it has become so enmeshed with the superstructure of the Hive 
that its removal, as in the past, may no longer be possible, meaning its detection by the Imperium could mean catastrophic consequences. The Vansar have built their entire faction around this STC. It may be assumed then that surely with this massive power source, the Vansar should have full control of Necromunda. You would presume so, except the STC which they have fortified and defended so passionately is also a curse for them. Whilst it yields them technological wealth and the capability to retain the STC and their secrecy, it also slowly poisons them, for the machine is damaged critically and continues to leach some form of dangerous poison, presumably a radiation, which steadily damages their blood and bone tissues. Their solution to this is to continually wear advanced body suits, developed presumably again by the STC, to mitigate this. But it merely delays the inevitable, eventually a Vansar will be sealed wholly into their suit to await the unstoppable, withering march of death upon them. The Vansar are a fascinating faction, as in many ways they represent one tiny speck of what truly remains of humanity out of the Dark Age of technology. They see themselves as the keepers of the truth and the secret knowledge of what humanity once was, and could be again. There is also more to this story. While most advanced civilizations were purged and scoured by the Emperor's Great Crusade, the Vansar endure, hidden away in the depths of a world waiting for something. Their clan, or gang, operates with a strict hierarchy. Only those at the highest levels will have direct access to, or even the ability to be present with the STC. The vast majority of their number will likely never even be allowed into the close proximity of their ancient source of power. And they are of course shielded by powerful individuals above. This coupled with deliberate campaigns of misdirection and ignorance of other humans who presume that any sight of their advanced tech is merely a lucky archaeotech find has helped to keep them hidden. Most, if not all on Necromunda presume that the Vansar are merely adept scavengers, traders of ancient tech. The truth is entirely unbelievable. Now as interesting as this all is, and I promise to discuss and consider the ins and outs of the Vansar more eventually, what has this got to do with our Lasgun considerations? Well quite a lot as it happens, because the crux of thinking about Las weapons comes down to a few things. Primarily, what is a laser? And then secondly, is the Imperium's description of what Las weapons actually do match up with what we understand to be limitations of a laser? My thought process being, you can call an apple an orange as many times as you like, but if it's not an orange, and it doesn't peel and open to reveal segments or tastes like an orange, then it's not an orange. So you can call a LAS gun a LAS rifle, a laser rifle, a laser gun, a laser pistol, till you're blue in the face. But if it doesn't operate how we understand a laser to be, it's not a laser weapon. The point being, descriptions of Vansar laser weapons add to the weight of evidence that LAS weapons are not really lasers, no matter how many times you find a statement using the word laser. For example, one key description that is rare to find among production of LAS weapons of the Imperium is something the Vansar use called suppression lasers. These are said to be able to deliver a high kinetic energy bolt, able to knock an enemy clean from their feet. They use larger power cells and are of a more complex construction. Also among Vansar sources, you find descriptions of focusing crystals and photonic energy cells. These kind of specifics are more absent from the rest of Imperial documentation. And for me, that is a really important fragment that you don't see elsewhere widely. The other important factor here for me is that unlike the Imperium, the Vansar are very obviously not part of the Mechanicus, and so their STC enable them to fabricate weaponry to a far higher quality, but also, most importantly, a much higher understanding, which is why it is presumably described in this way. And that is critical. So of course we finally come to the science part, because when it comes to speaking about any of these laser beams or weapons, they're usually so poorly defined, for good reason, that we'd be better off speaking about them more generally as directed energy weapons, because that's what they really are. 
and this is even mentioned in descriptions of early LAS rifles used in the Horus Heresy. It's thankfully one of the few places you find 40k LAS weapons phrased as directed energy weapons. Bless Alan Bly, the man really knew what he was talking about. LAS rifles were among those weapons favoured by of course the Solar Auxiliae, the elite human fighters of terror and who were often considered merely a step below the Astartes. Now to start with the obvious, as everybody loves to point out, lasers are just beams of light and light has no mass, meaning turning on a laser beam from a weapon is not producing any kind of chemical reaction, there's no propellant force as a regular projectile firearm would. Recoil is caused when a gun fires, the bullet moving forward pushed by propellant gases which are also moving forward with positive velocity. The momentum of this must even out, so this is why you get the negative velocity you feel as the recoil into the weapon. Equal and opposite force, etc. Which is basically to say that momentum must always be conserved one way or another, even in say a rail gun. As some bright sparks have pointed out, at the most technical and small scale possible, it may be true that a laser does create something you could determine to be recoil. But we're talking about such small scale, it's nothing you'd be able to feel, likely nothing that would be very easy even to measure. When talking about laser guns, this phrasing of light beams is usually when you see dismissive comments about flashlights, torches, etc. Bear in mind though, that even a torch or flashlight could theoretically cut clean through steel were it powerful enough and close enough. You wouldn't feel recoil though, of course. Overall, there's a hell of a lot of mixed up thinking when it comes to laser weapons, most of which comes down to bad fictional representations, similarly to my bugbears about other things like time travel. Now very obviously, light is all around us, it's mostly diffused. To use light as something that can cause damage, you want it to be the opposite, high energy and focused. Anybody who spent time with a magnifying glass in the sun will have learned this, and that, in a sense, gives an idea of how powerful light can be, in that if focused to a point, it can cut, burn and make things combust, like, say, a laser. So light, it's just moving energy in the form of photons. But whereas light all around us, as I say, is diffuse, directed energy in the form of a laser has what's called coherence, meaning instead of light just going in any direction it wants, it's focused to a single point where all these photons are going in the same single direction. This is why in theory, a laser can become a weapon, whereas a light bulb does not. A laser can be anything up to or beyond one million times more powerful than a light bulb. And to create a laser, you need a lasing medium, i.e. a source of atoms to excite and emit light on the required wavelength. This could be a gas, a liquid, even a solid. You also need an energy source to then pump these atoms into your lasing medium. And then importantly, you need to focus your beam using a lens and mirrors. Put simply, a laser, in the terms we're thinking of, a laser weapon is about storing and then releasing energy either in a burst or pulse or a continual beam. To be clear, when we say burst or pulse, this isn't really anything more fancy than just the laser going on and off very quickly, but down to nanoseconds. However, there are much bigger issues than recoil, as I've said, and these issues consign laser weapons really as a concept far more into the realm of science fiction and endless theory crafting. Because whilst it's true that more laser based tech is used today and even for some military purposes, the overall concept of laser based infantry that you see in sci-fi, weapons that could just shoot and cut clean through a person, we are nowhere close to that. And as I've observed in my searching, people who discuss regularly these kind of things actually seem to struggle to agree on how to best conceptualize this, mainly due to the kind of energy levels required, but there are other problematic things as well. One of the basic problem with laser weapons, true laser weapons, is their need to focus. And I don't mean focus the energy into a laser beam, I mean the focal position. Just as when you were destroying our future ant overlords with that magnifying glass and the sun, you probably noticed that positioning the lens affects the ability of the magnifying glass to focus and create a concentrated spot size. Well, it's just the same with a laser, or roughly speaking anyway. The point is that the science fiction concept of running around blasting a laser gun in terms of a beam is not particularly practical. And that's even before you get to issues of changing out lenses, keeping them clean, 
Let's say though that your laser rifle is focused to 200 meters. The further or nearer your target is from that focal point is going to make it dramatically less likely that they will get a burning exploding hole cut through them. Which if you're also on the run on the battlefield is going to be very difficult to continually calibrate settings to that level of precision. As opposed to say a standard projectile weapon where range is of course important but far less finicky than a laser rifle. But maybe that's what the machine spirit of the lasgun is for to calculate it for you so you just point and fire. Science is evolving quite rapidly when it comes to military applications of lasers. The US military apparently has a whole slew of projects underway exploring lasers potential including some that fire pulses of light hitting with explosive effect which sounds quite familiar to a lasgun. Then of course the stuff people are familiar with lasers mounted on battleships some on ground vehicles but the main problem remains this issue of focusing. Also, unlike their fictional counterparts, current lasers do not just fire and cut through a thing. They also require what's known as dwell time. And this is because the lasers are self-focusing, they adjust to bring the target point, and then the laser remains until it melts or destroys its target. It may take some time to do that. So it's not quite a las cannon just yet. In terms of real-world applications, like missiles and other usually airborne targets though, it's acceptable because so long as it can be tracked and a lock maintained, then it's going to presumably be effective, and it must be given that they're actually building and using these things. Now apparently also some ultra-short pulsed lasers are being tested, and the problem is that as usual when it comes to lasers, their power usage is extremely high, numbers like 5 million megawatts and the size of a shipping container, but powerful or not, you're either going to be burning a hole through your target or just making them feel unpleasantly warm, depending on its ability to focus properly. These ultra-short laser pulses seem to have an unusual property of becoming self-focusing. Not to mention that these laser pulses vaporize the target as they hit, not the entire target, but just the point at where they hit. So instead of being focused to a slow burn like a laser beam, they vaporize the small surface point into plasma and powerful enough to say cut through sheet metal. Now if we're talking about energy required for laser weapons, I did a fair amount of reading scattered across the net about this kind of thing. And some descriptions of theoretical laser weapons are pretty confusing and quite word salady, even more so than me. Plus it's made worse by the fact that even when people seem to know what they're talking about, they're often contradicted by others who also sound equally as confident and coherent, but with completely different numbers. So I think it's easier to just say people don't really know how to make an infantry scale laser gun yet. Now, I'm sure there are many who could happily talk about energy specifics of laser pulses and what or would not be enough to do the job, but it's ultimately entirely academic. If you know anything about this stuff, there also seems to be a debate about this issue of plasma that I mentioned just now, and it being created as it vaporizes a small part at the target site of a laser pulse, and that this plasma could potentially absorb the energy being delivered in subsequent pulses, thus diminishing their effectiveness. But then some speculate, no, this would burn off so quickly that by the time a next pulse hits, it doesn't create plasma or hit plasma, it will just burn into the target, cratering it again and again and again with each pulse, i.e. when you fire the laser pulse, it actually cuts into people. And this seems to be what scientists and the military are banking on, this attempting to create these pulsing, self-focusing laser beams. But before we get to drilling laser holes through people with direct energy bursts, consider that when you pull the trigger, you're firing, you're pulsing, and it's true that pulses are moving very fast. The pulses of the laser, they're moving the speed of light. But what isn't moving the speed of light is what is causing the pulse, that switching on off of the laser, because that's what's causing it to pulse basically. This is also where it becomes tricky because in order for that pulsing beam of energy to be in any way effective, it's relying on each pulse hitting the same exact spot again and again. Now granted, this laser pulse is happening in a very, very small time frame of nanoseconds, but nonetheless, if your target was on the move, combined with your ability to hold the weapon absolutely still at considerable range, it's not gonna be delivering maybe the full power of that pulsing shot, which potentially really undermines its viability as a weapon. In many ways, when we look at descriptions of las guns and how they operate, they appear to sound much more like a Volkite weapon in some respects in how they're illustrated. 
But if we're still talking about a laser weapon and you can't keep your highly focused laser on target, then its pulses are going to hit diffusely and do basically nothing. And that's kind of a big problem, especially if your target was, say, wearing armor as well. And then you have the wavelength of the light. A laser tends to be red or green, you also get blue and so on. And this can mean whatever surface you're firing at could have a significant impact on the amount of energy being absorbed, which is a pretty major issue, as it could mean some enemies literally walk through your fire, whereas some are cut to pieces. Just think about how a black piece of material and a white piece of material, black will absorb the sun's energy more than a white piece of material which will reflect it. Then there's yet more science that's far more complex than I can quasi understand. But basically, depending on the means by which the laser is being created, then the total input energy could have a significantly detrimental effect on the lifetime of the pump medium. What the hell does that mean? Well, it appears to mean, as I understood it, power packs for a LAS gun may not be the only thing which might need regularly changing out. Which does bring us to the biggest issue with a laser or a LAS gun, the power packs. Now, highly advanced or not, it's going to require some godly advanced science to make LAS weapons feasible. Because the one thing that seems generally agreed upon is that for a LAS weapon to truly have any hope of being effective, it requires considerable energy stored. Now, say we just assume that problem is solved. Then you run into another issue, as the power pack itself becomes a pretty large issue. Consider that if a group of guardsmen took a direct grenade blast and it hit some of their power packs, you'd likely see them all immediately vaporized by the powerful blast of energy released by their power pack cook-off in what might appear to be something akin to a very small nuclear explosion. Now, I know your battery in your torch wouldn't do that, or your laser pointer, but for a LAS gun to be in any way capable of what it's supposed to do, it's going to need to be carrying a considerably large amount of power. Speaking of the power, this also brings us to the next chain of problems. You see, with a laser weapon, as the power pack is drained, every shot is going to create a less powerful beam to be produced over time. Real world example, laser pointers are easier to see this with than a torch because laser pointers are lasers and far faster draining of batteries. There's some good YouTube channels that mess around with laser pointers. Also, don't screw around with laser pointers. They're incredibly dangerous and could easily blind you or others. But basically, as the battery is drained, you will note that it doesn't just say stay at 100% strength until it stops working. It steadily degrades in strength. So imagine instead that you're using a laser weapon, your second shot will be less powerful than the first, the third, less than the second, and so on. It's not exactly ideal, is it? Nor is this ever illustrated. Fictional laser weapons are nearly always shown as functioning exactly as a projectile weapon's ammunition. It's good and consistent with every shot, delivering a relatively consistent destructive force, which is not likely how it would function unless, you know, future spaceosity we don't understand. One of the best illustrations of this was actually in the movie Akira, where you see Kaneda fighting with Tetsuo, and where his laser gun is initially quite successful, as the battery weakens and he attempts to fire, it doesn't deal any damage, doesn't seem to hurt him, and eventually you see the beam just fail. Incidentally, that laser weapon is probably one of the best illustrations of how a laser beam may actually work, in just how the beam fires, its dimensions, and the fact that it needs a sizable battery pack. You even see them later trying to recharge the battery using their bikes, which sounds very similar to the LAS gun and recharging power packs from the fire. So just to punctuate this science discussion, let's ask the question again. Strictly speaking, should a laser gun cause recoil? The answer is basically no, because even if you're powering the laser with massive amounts of energy from your packs, there's no chemical, no kinetic reaction, there's no recoil. Quite honestly though, the far bigger issue is all the other far more pertinent technical problems that we've been looking at, which for me are way more problematic than wondering does the weapon kick a bit when fired, which many people seem happy to attribute even to some weapon discharge energy thing of some variety. But I do get why people get hung up on it, but laser guns and this recoil issue feels more like people reaching for the low hanging fruit of fictional space gun technicalities. 
But here's another thing. For example, I discovered that a million watt pulse laser when firing is going to struggle to really do anything more than superficially mark the surface of most metals. Whereas, say the National Ignition Facility in the US, which houses some of the most powerful lasers in the world, requires entire banks of capacitors in massive storage facilities to work. These power the beams which they state can deliver a combined energy of up to 1.8 megajoules and a peak power of 500 terawatts, creating pressures greater than 100 terapascals, which is 1 billion times Earth's atmospheric pressure, and temperatures up to 100 million kelvins. Which sounds very impressive, except for the fact that on further researching, you'd still need something considerably more powerful than that for dealing heavy damage, as per something like a LAS cannon in 40k. Why though? Well, firstly, because as powerful as all that sounds, it's also focused into that tight laser beam. So, in order to cut through a heavily armoured target with some reasonable diameter and not just a pinpoint, it's going to need to be about 10 times more powerful, remembering our earlier thoughts about focusing a beam. If it's lower energy, you can still make it powerful by focusing it. But if you want the beam to be powerful and also wide, you need to seriously up the power. Not to mention, think of what happens to energy when it's directed to a surface. It dissipates in the form of heat, entropy, meaning that you'd also lose some percentage of your energy at that point of contact, as well as potentially ionizing the air. Any debris and plasma at the target site could also interfere with efficiency. So it's difficult to use a laser realistically for, say, destroying an armoured target like a tank or a ship. You'd need to generate power tens of times more than an entire building's worth of the largest laser facilities. Or, you know, alternatively, you could just fire a powerful standard armour-piercing projectile around at your target that comparatively costs pennies. Job done. And this is where lasers or 40k LAS weapons only become practical, really, if you're in the realm of fiction whereby somehow you can generate these insane levels of power required safely to actually deal damage from an infantry-held device. The only realm where laser weapons theoretically seem to make any sense are for fighting, say, in space, where any kind of interference is less likely, and the ships themselves also provide enough of a platform for the storage capacity of a sizable laser or beam weapon. So, this all sounds a bit bleak and fun police in making the case against the flashlight guns of 40k, doesn't it? Well, not necessarily, but as I've said several times, if you want laser weapons to work in any fictional verse, it truly relies on you being willing to lean in on the spaceosity of things like a LAS gun and applying a fairly strong degree of disbelief suspension. Which again, if you're doing that for something to be merely practically usable, why do you care about technical details like recoil at all. The blunt bottom line is, you really have to either accept the nonsense of future laser guns and all their strange misunderstood descriptions, or you should simply say no laser weapons. Still, your one way to get around that is if we're considering weaponry produced by the zenith level of human tech in the golden age, it seems plausible that they surely would have been capable of creating sufficiently powerful and efficient energy sources way beyond, say, our comprehension, that such a laser weapon would have been plausible. It's not that laser weapons themselves have no practical applications either, it's more the way they're visibly represented that becomes problematic, not to mention the wildly dangerous prospect of having your entire army running around firing powerful laser rifles in all directions. Let's hope if all those lasers get reflected off in weird directions, even at low power, you don't end up blinding your own infantry, or obviously worse. So, when it comes to lasers or LAS weapons in 40k, for me personally, as in my opinion, the right question comes down to simply this. Which is more important, a misplaced use of the word laser or the observed functionality of the weapon in the law? For me, it's the latter. You may disagree, as we're all entitled to do so. In my opinion, if you bin the word laser, suddenly it opens up a lot more acceptable suspension of disbelief. Because otherwise it just doesn't work. For some reason though, fictional verses are absolutely obsessed with saying laser. 
I guess because it's cool and spacey and sounds better than directed energy weapon. Or why didn't they just stick to calling them las weapons, but not actually say laser? I think it comes down to purely how much you're willing to bend your acceptance of lore descriptions and depiction versus science. Las weapons sit better with me if I consider that it's not strictly a laser weapon, but more some kind of advanced energy weapon that is just concentrating energy into some kind of bolt, thus delivering a massive amount of directed energy, as you might with, say, many pulses from a laser. But instead of firing a point-focused beam or a pulse, to my mind, a lasgun bolt delivers the same power as all of those laser pulses all at once to the target in this bolt form. You still hear that hiss and crack as the weapon fires and air is ionized. You get some level of recoil from however the science of Zenith advanced weaponry allows, as this seems to be illustrated throughout lasgun usage. There are even descriptions of the internal workings of lasguns having ignition rings, which apparently if not maintained will stop the weapon from functioning. Make of that what you will. But as I noted in the beginning, in terms of actual representation, it's literally all over the place. From the first and second editions, right through to new material. Gaunt's Ghosts, as many people pointed out, has several references to recoil and other Lasgun specifics, but one instance that I thought was noteworthy, this is from Oni in Death. Quote, the Las rifle emptied its entire load in one disastrous cough of energy. The blast threw Merry down on his back, the blistering ball of discharge hit rocks 20 meters away and exploded like a tube charge. So the weapon firing apparently caused enough recoil to even throw somebody to the ground. Some references speak about las weapons being entirely survivable as well, as they cauterize the wound as they hit. In others, they talk about las blasts melting enemies from the inside. In others, it describes how a rapid fire blast from a fully automatic las gun can cut somebody in half. In another, it states that a skull is enough to withstand the penetrative power of a las pistol, but it's hot enough still to vaporize the brain inside and strip flesh off. All of these constant contradictions make it almost impossible to draw any consistent conclusions, because there seems to be no consensus, or really even effort, to apply any sense of continuity to las weapons. And that's actually pretty unusual. Most weapons in 40k operate with a pretty established parameter, roughly speaking. So it's very odd just how all over the place las weapons were once I started looking. I always knew that there were references which kind of contradicted, but I was very surprised at just how much there is. The descriptions of las bolts are in fact just about the only singular thing that is universally consistent. So that's what I'm clinging on to. That and the fact that firing the weapon emits an audible crack or some kind of sound. This is likely meant to suggest the shot is, as we say, ionizing the air. When the energy lands, it delivers a powerful, explosive thermal impact, enough to burn through less well-armored targets, even vaporize flesh from the extreme concentrated energy, but not enough to penetrate through more powerful armored units, especially, say, ceramite. Now, just how the weapon specifically technically works? Who knows? Golden Age tech, it's way above our pay grade. Any specific behavior such as recoil suddenly seems within the full context of the technology to be really a very small, almost irrelevant technical detail. And who knows how it could be caused? Maybe it's caused by those ignition rings. How the hell do we know? Of course, if you are so inclined to really dig heels in on the fact that las guns are laser weapons, pure and simple, light has no mass, etc., it's fine. You just also have to be ready to equally rationalize all the other considerable quantity of references, illustrations, game animations, general source lore about las guns, and how they don't seem to behave like laser weapons in either their description, impact or operation, plus also how they've been consistently depicted as operating with recoil across many games for the past decade. Do laser weapons have recoil? No. Do las guns have recoil? Probably yes. They do seem to have recoil. Don't blame me either, I'm just the bloody messenger, alright? Las guns are referenced more in terms of some kind of direct energy projectile weapon than anything else. There's a consistent use of las bolt language, explosions, impact energy shells, I'd say more so than beams or direct pulses of energy. 
because those are reserved for something more like the multi-laser or gatling lasers. And it does seem ridiculous, but when it comes to LAS weapons, as I've noted, the thing that really makes it a mess is simply the use of the word LAS and laser. And this is by no means something unique to 40k, of course. So many space verses have laser guns, blasters, call them what you want to. A LAS gun, comparative to our laser technology today, is so far disconnected and advanced, direct comparisons are difficult at best. Ultimately, in a galaxy as horrific, insane, and confusing as the 40k verse, worrying about technicalities like the LAS gun is a fun bit of a distraction. But it is purely this, a distraction. Does the Krieg Guardsmen question their weapon as they climb atop their trenches and charge headlong into enemy fire? Do any citizens of the Imperium dare to wonder how the inner workings of technology function, or to consider that perhaps they're not as they should be? No, they merely accept. When it comes to things like the functionality and operation of a LAS gun, LAS rifle, LAS pistol, it is perhaps best for ourselves that we just accept it for what it is, a tool of the Emperor of Man. Because just like the LAS gun, so is mankind itself. And as Lord Primarch Gulliman has reminded us, my father is no god, it is men who do his work for him, as I must now. He uses people, he always has. So let's now talk about my next selection for Audible. In keeping with our LAS gun theme, I chose two which lean in on that category. The reason I wanted to suggest two selections today is because both Krieg and the Gaunt's series offer something quite clearly different. Krieg focuses in on very obviously the death core of Krieg and it visualizes everything that is faceless, anonymous and horrific about the Imperium. The polar opposite to the Gaunt's series which paints us a picture of far more rich individual characters that are by now the stuff of legends within the lore of 40k. Both Krieg and Thurston only mention LAS guns and their use plenty, so you'll be able to get a solid idea of the kind of things that I've been talking about through this video today. More specifically, Krieg gives a pretty lengthy exploration of the Death Corps through the eyes of other members of the Imperial Guard. Before I listened to Krieg, I did actually see some negative reviews, but quite honestly, I couldn't really have disagreed more. I thought it was a thoroughly good listen. Maybe a little lengthy in places, but I can hardly be the one to complain about scripts being too long. By the end, it certainly hammers home a solid picture of just what being a Kriegsman is all about. Gaunt's goes first and only, well, there's little I can say without spoiling such a legendary opening to an amazing series. So I think best you just find out for yourself. But as a recommendation, you can't go far wrong. It focuses on the region known as the Sabbat Worlds, which many people will know. And this system and the story behind it is a fascinating and particular favourite for me, especially Saint Sabbat. Now obviously Gaunt's is a very character driven series, so if that's something you're a fan of, characters that you'll follow through on a journey, again, can't go wrong. And really, it's the polar opposite of my other selection today, because whereas Krieg is all about the anonymous members of the Death Corps, Gaunt's Ghost series is all about putting an individual face on Guardsmen. So have fun picking out the references to Lasgun, Las Rounds, Las Bolts, Recoil, Kinetic Force, and so on. Krieg and First and Only, my two recommends for today. As a final reminder, if you're new to all of this, you can start listening today with a free 30-day Audible trial and get full access to thousands of audiobooks, originals, and podcasts included in the Plus catalog. Visit audible.com slash Lutin and text Lutin to 500-500 for those in the US. Thanks for your support as always, and I'll see you all in the next one.